Well, tonight we're up to the second commandment, and I'm going to call this one the manner of worship, but let us start by praying. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening and for this great commandment. We pray that you would help us to understand your law and to apply it to, your, to our hearts and to understand uh, what is wrong with the carving of idols. So we pray that you would challenge us and, and change us and make us reverent for your worship as you have dictated in your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 through 6. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Well, as we approach the second commandment, I think it'd be well to remember that the Ten Commandments all belong to the moral law. And we need to remember why that's the case and apply that to each commandment. So about the second, Calvin says about those who would defend the images that they pretend that the Jews were forbidden to use them on account of their proneness to superstition, as if a prohibition which the Lord founds on his own eternal essence and the uniform course of nature could be restricted to a single nation, end quote. You see what he's saying there? It's founded on the essence of God, and it is in the nature, the light of nature, in every human heart. Well, that's what we meant by the moral law. There's a couple other ways to see this. For one, we see that right worship belongs to the moral law and the judgment of the Lord upon the worship of Cain, back in Genesis 4, in distinction to the worship of Abel. Now, somebody might say to that, well, that whole episode, that was about the heart. Cain's heart wasn't right. But I think that would miss the point of how his heart was directed at the form of sacrifice that he gave, which the text very strongly hints was that it was not the first of his fruit. It wasn't that he offered fruit and Abel offered blood. A lot of people have theorized that, and that seems to make sense on the surface of it, but it just doesn't work because the Hebrew word mincha that is used about Cain's offering is used to the fruit and the grain off or the grain offerings at least later on in the law. So that's an acceptable sacrifice. That's not really the main thing that's going on there. Yes, it was his heart, but his heart did not regard how God had made it clear for them to worship. But it can also be seen in Romans 1, where Paul charges the nations with falling away from what? Is it just truth? Or is it something more? Is it simply the knowledge of God? Or is it not that the children of Adam rejected right worship? And here we see in Romans 1, starting in verse 22, that claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. This rejection of true worship assumes that something of religion was written on their hearts from the very beginning. And so in these ways, we can see that, yes, this second commandment as well is moral law. Now, question 97 of the Heidelberg Catechism asks, what does God require in the second commandment? Answer, that we in no wise make any image of God, 
nor worship him in any other way than he has commanded in his word. What we're going to do tonight is break this up into two parts. And they're the two parts of that answer. The first part is the context of worship. Second, the regulation of the word. So we're just going to start super simple with just really asking the question, what is an image? And if it's more than we might be thinking of, we'll see why the word of God regulating worship would come into that. So context of worship, regulation of the word. Let's start simple, 101 level. We'll have a couple weeks to get in and and draw out uh, what I talked about last time, Calvin's uh, helping us with this anatomy of idolatry. And we'll, we'll see that next time. But let's just look at the context of worship. What all is meant by an image? Well, Calvin is helpful here. He argues what is the majority position, namely that graven image is really Moses using a particular literary device that's known as a synecdoche. Now, we don't use that a whole lot. You may have seen that in a commentary. Um, but really what that is, is that a part of a concept is representing a whole. For example, a hired hand. That really means a whole worker, doesn't it? Not just the hand walking around, right? Or else it can mean a whole of what is a part, as in Alabama won the Sugar Bowl. Now, we understand when somebody says that, they mean it's college football team. Not everyone in the state, much less everything in the state. We understand that that means Alabama's football team. Likewise, this way of speaking could be a species that encompasses its whole genus, or, other way around, a genus as one of its species. And so, in this very way, God has Moses signify through the carving of an image. And this is going to be a big definition, but try to get your mind wrapped around this and I'll repeat it. What he means by a carving of an image is the refashioning of any element of worship that God has fashioned into a nature that is according to his nature. So God has commanded something in worship, and that something is speaking about his nature. That something has a nature. Don't mess with that. Why? Because that nature, that element of worship, is ultimately after his nature. So let's repeat that one more time. To break the second commandment is to refashion any element of worship that God has fashioned into a nature that is according to his nature. How do we know that it encompasses all this? Well, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. The Puritan William Perkins explained that what is forbidden is twofold. First, false conceptions of God and Christ. Second, when God is worshipped otherwise and by other means than he hath revealed in the word. Perkins says, For when men set up a devised worship, they set up also a devised God. So that's just Perkins' way of saying the same thing. Now, this specifically forbids images as objects of worship. What we're going to do here is we're going to go from general to most specific. We're going to... Um, we're going to really set the bar low in a, in a sense at first and say, well, this pertains to just this. But then we're going to drill a little bit deeper. This is specifically forbidden images as objects of worship. The very next words of the commandment confirm that the context here is formal worship. In Exodus 20, verse 5, you shall not bow down to them or serve them. And we get a sense of that from reading the rest of the Pentateuch as a whole. You see, ancient people, including the Jews, did not restrict their definition of worship the way that we tend to do. And that is ironically a restriction of overgeneralization. How many times have you heard this? All of life is worship. And of course, that's true. But that's not all that worship is. God did not leave worship as an overgeneralization in his word. In fact, no one's really ever done so, nor do most people groups today. The notion 
of exclusively privatized worship is really a mirage of radical individualism in the modern West. Now, of course, every lie is a twisted truth. We can say, in truth, that all of life is worship. But when we say this in a way that discounts the corporate dimension of God's people assembling, um, we're suffering from a mad delusion. Ancient Israel was an assembled people for exactly this thing. It was their whole reason for being. It's our whole reason for being. We're brought into that commonwealth of Israel. And so to bow down and serve these idols points directly to the use of such objects as ends or mediums of religious devotion. And that's going to be very crucial. We're talking about specific objects here. The context is as ends or mediums of religious devotion. Now, a couple things that you may have been thinking as you look on the surface of the words of the commandment. What we want to say is that this does not forbid art per se. Notice the qualification in the commandment. You may have caught these words. Any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. And at the extreme, if you just look at those words, it seems to some people, in fact to many people, to be forbidding any depicting of any created thing. Don't make a likeness of any of these things. Well, context, context, context. Charles Hodge argues against this extreme approach by saying that the second commandment does not forbid pictorial or sculptured representations of ideal or visible objects is plain because the whole command has reference to religious worship and because Moses at the command of God himself, made many such images and representations. In summary, God is not forbidding art here, not even religious art, but rather images in public worship. Now, naturally, this also implies that one not bow down to any such thing in private either, right? As it says later on in Deuteronomy 27, 15, cursed be the man who makes a carved or cast metal image, an abomination to the Lord, a thing made by the hands of a craftsman, and sets it up in secret. Makes sense. If the whole reason you can't do it over here is because of religious devotion, well, you can't do that same thing in private. These were the household idols. And these were also forbidden by implication. But we have to start with the primary context of public worship. But see, then that just raises another implication, which you might also still be thinking of, because this does not even forbid art in the sanctuary. We know this, first of all, because of the Lord's instructions to the craftsmen of both ark and sanctuary. For example, a couple of verses. Two cherubim of gold on the two ends of the mercy seat in Exodus 25, verse 18. This is at the very center of where God would dwell, the mercy seat. He instructs them to engrave two cherubim of gold. Cherubim were also woven into the ten curtains in Exodus 36, 8. Engraved into the golden lampstand, there were three cups made like almond blossoms, six branches going out of the lampstand, Exodus 25, 13. So things in nature too. And later on, when they got in the land in Solomon's temple in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 18, the cedar within the house was carved in the form of gourds and open flowers. And then finally, reading on in chapter 6, starting in verse 23, in the inner sanctuary, he made two cherubim of olive wood, each ten cubits high. Five cubits was the length of one wing of the cherub, and five cubits the length of the other wing of the cherub. It was ten cubits from the tip of one wing to the tip of the other. The other cherub also measured ten cubits. Both cherubim had the same measure and the same form. The height of one cherub was ten cubits, and so was that of the other cherub. He put the cherubim in the innermost part of the house. 
Now, if that's true, then what was all the qualifications about nature? Stuff in all the different places of the earth. Well, of course, the ancient pagans borrowed from the world of nature, as well as the animal world, in order to confine their deities to something that would make sense to worship. In other words, as we indicated last time, something to manipulate, something they can control, something they could really not just get their heads around, get their hands around and worship on their own terms. Now, we could also argue from the Hebrew pesel in the commandment that the word was specifically used for objects to which the people bowed. It was not the neutral Hebrew word for any old artifact. And the corresponding command in Leviticus 26.1 makes the connection a bit more explicit. You shall not make idols for yourself or erect an image or pillar. You shall not set up a figured stone in your land to bow down to it, for I am the Lord your God. And so the qualifying language here in Exodus 20, verse 4, about all these things in creation are just that. They're qualifiers for the imaging of God. God is not to be thought of as any kind of created thing. So does that make sense in the context of bowing down and serving of an object of religious devotion? Well, secondly, let's look at the regulation of the word. This is the second part of the answer to the catechism question. It's not simply that we will in no way make an image of God, but also we will not worship him in any other way than he is commanded in his word. Now, notice in this Heidelberg answer, the anticipation of the Westminster Confession of Faith's regulative principle from the century later. Now, the regular principle's got a lot of ink and it's been often misunderstood, but if you've never heard it before, here it is. It's in chapter 21, section 1 of the Westminster Confession of Faith, and it says this, But the acceptable way of worshiping the true God is instituted by himself and so limited by his own revealed will that he may not be worshiped according to the imaginations and devices of men, or the suggestions of Satan under any visible representation or any other way not prescribed in the Holy Scripture. Now, ultimately, what's really being said here is that Reformed worship will be biblical worship. And that means, literally, is that we will worship by the book. But what do we mean by literal? Well, the first thing we mean something very positive, and as a phrase that Ligon Duncan used a few times in our worship class at RTS Orlando to drive home this idea, and I'll probably butcher it a little bit, but very simply it says, in our services, we read the Bible, preach the Bible, pray the Bible, sing the Bible. And you just think about it, and you, you unfortunately, Roman Catholic churches Eastern Orthodox churches, even Anglican churches, Lutheran churches, whatever it is on the spectrum. Now, very often, these services, because of their liturgy, are saturated in the Scripture. And one of the ironies here is we evangelicals will beat our chest over having our Bibles in our churches. But do we have them open? Do we hear them? And very often, churches that will not get the gospel right will often hear the gospel more because of how much of the word is flowing through their liturgy. And so this idea is founded upon a principle that the whole Christian tradition would have recognized in times past, and that is the principle that is called lex arandi, lex credendi. It's a Latin phrase, and it basically means that the law of belief is the law of worship, or the law of worship is the law of belief. Now, Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox might pack that with different meaning than we would. Anglicans and Lutherans may pack that with different meaning than the Reformers would. But we would, at all, we would all at least agree on a principle. And that principle is that how we worship determines what we worship. Because its forms, its liturgy, and everybody has a liturgy, that just means your form of worship. 
Its forms teach theology to us. Whether we are aware of it or not, whether we appreciate that fact or not, how we worship determines what we worship. By these words in the Heidelberg, any other way than he has commanded, we understand that there's a spectrum. On one end of the spectrum, we might find, say, the Lutheran view, which would permit whatever God does not forbid. And on the other, perhaps a more Puritan view that would seem to forbid whatever God did not prescribe. That's sort of the J.I. Packer way of saying it. However, it's important not to make a straw man of the Puritan view. There's actually a rich diversity, but there's a general principle. John Owen and Thomas Manton in particular made much of the internal way of worship in the New Covenant. And the latter of those Puritans, Thomas Manton, said that external worship is but a means to the internal. In fact, why do we get these forms so right? Why do we want to hear God's way to structure worship? Because that is the channel through which the heart of worship can be inflamed by means that God has prescribed and therefore which the Holy Spirit will honor. And it was in their confession that we find that wonderful phrase about when something's biblical. When is something biblical? Well, it's, it's either when it's expressly set down in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture. Not to mention that it was about public worship that they added later on in that chapter 1, section 6, that there are some circumstances concerning the worship of God and government of the church common to human actions and societies, which are to be ordered by the light of nature and Christian prudence, according to the general rules of the word, which are always to be observed. So you have general rules, but then you have this light of nature and Christian prudence. What's that? Well, to get a handle on that, let's just introduce a little bit more grammar. All of this is really to say that the Reformed make a distinction in worship, in liturgy, between what we call elements of worship and circumstances of worship. So what are these and why is this important? Well, elements of worship are those necessary ingredients of worship. They are the, the sine qua non, the without which not, that you must have. Now think of the marks of the church, you know, the word, the sacraments, and discipline. How do I know there's a church? Well, if they have those. Well, how do I know if there's biblical worship? Well, it's these elements of worship, the things that must be present for it to be actual Christian worship. Things like the word of God preached and publicly read, 1 Timothy 4.13. Corporate prayer, 1 Timothy 2.8. The administration of sacraments given to the church, Matthew 28, 19, and 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 20. The singing of some psalms and hymns and spiritual songs in Ephesians 5, 18 and Colossians 3, 16. Elements are essential to congregational worship. You've got to have those. But what about circumstances? Well, by circumstances of worship, we just mean those things that the Puritans said in that statement are going to vary according to general principles from the word, but applied by that light of nature, which is basically reason and custom working together. But it's not a willy-nilly reason and custom, but rather it is an objective, culture-situated quest to most powerfully channel those elements that God has given it. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, think of the elements as that divine power. Think of it. The word, prayer. Well, what does God say? Those th The sacrament. What do those do? Do they do anything? Do these work? They're God's grace and power. So think of the elements as that power, like the bullet in a gun, your firepower. And think of the circumstances as the proper channel, the barrel, for the maximization of its projection. 
So the word has to be there. But let's just use an example. What about the arrangement of chairs? Let's you know, say you get into an argument about that before church. And somebody says, I think we should put the chairs in a semicircle or around tables or something. And I say, wait, what, did, did you learn nothing about the place of preaching? And the person says, what are you talking about? I believe in preaching. I believe in preaching through the word, verse by verse, and so on and so forth. But where in the Bible does it say that you have to have the chairs all seated to the front? Well, let's see, here's what's happening. It's true that the word does not specify that the chairs have to be here versus there. However, if preaching does what the Bible says it does, then the reason we will point the chairs at the pulpit rather than in a semicircle or at tables is because that firepower of the word is channeled more appropriately through that barrel of straight on hearing. So, yes, the circumstances will vary, but when we do the circumstances, we will do them in a way that is most conducive to the elements. Given our culture, yes, but most conducive that the elements would flow. You see that? So there's a logic to it. This commandment, the second, also reflects the gracious truth that God takes the initiative in worship. This is built into the Reformed understanding of our call to worship, the invocation. But more to the point, how gracious of God to not leave us to guess in our approach to him. And so if we look at this and say, you know, I just read the story of Nadab and Abihu. And just when I was prepared to make a new covenant theology argument to make myself forget all about that, I read about Ananias and Sapphira. And I figured out that God was just as holy in the New Testament as he was in the Old Testament. And here you are telling me that all this stuff matters. I feel condemned. Well, hold on just a minute there. It's not as though God has left us to guess. Yes, he is holy. And that is the point of that story in Leviticus 10. But God graciously fills up his book with how he would be worshipped and how gracious of him to do that. Well, let's apply this to those three different areas, the civil use, the directive use and the evangelical uses of the law. And remember why we're doing it in that order. We want to end with the gospel. But use number one, the civil use. And again, here we are on the first table. Can't have anything to do with the public interest. Not so. In one county in Tennessee, just in recent days, in their phase one of reopening um, to, the, to the churches, to the community, the memo made the point to say, that it was going to restrict the physical partaking of the sacraments in California. Oh, sorry, that one is in Tennessee. But California is doing something roughly similar. And there was one other county doing that. In the case of Illinois, they're restricting church attendance altogether. We'll get to that when we talk about the fourth commandment. But in California, they've added singing. And Kentucky uh, joined them in that very thing. Singing has been outlawed in live stream services and when they come back together. Many authorities have spoken of taking even greater measures in restricting kinds of anti-government or anti-establishment speech content from the platforms that air the preaching. So, sacraments, singing, and preaching. So let's just start with those elements of worship since that's what we're talking about. Consider these premises for a moment. A simple syllogism, just let it flow down, and it follows exactly everything we've seen. Premise one, no divine imperatives are revocable by civil magistrates. So you got that? If God's really commanded it, then the civil government can't say no. That's one of those things we agree that we're on a collision course with the state at that point. So that's premise one, no divine imperatives are revocable by civil magistrates. Premise two, all elements of worship are divine imperatives. Therefore, it follows by resistless logic that no elements of worship are revocable by civil magistrates. As Peter said to the council in Acts chapter 4, verse 19 and 20, 
Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Now, for a long time, people have had the luxury in their Disneyland Christianity and in the suburbs to say, well, that's just talking about, you know, if it comes down to it, the gospel. You know, if it comes down to it, if they say something against what God has clearly said. Well, here you are. But there's an objection to this, and I want to make this objection as respectable as it can be so we can feel the weight of how it doesn't quite meet the demand of the day. And the objection is that, wait a minute, there is a precedence in the Christian tradition, even among the Puritans, and we've heard Baxter quoted toward this end, there's a precedence for the church to observe the state's edict to close churches in the case of plague if it meets two standards, if it is temporary and intelligibly temporary, and can clearly be demonstrated to be on behalf of public health. The state has an interest in that. And my reply to that is, let's grant that point for the sake of argument. That would still only show that the power still belongs to the church to judge on the merits of A and B. Is it temporary? Is it clearly demonstrated to be on behalf of public health? The magistrate may make his appeal, and the church would be within its rights in each locale to take care against the relative dangers of both plague and sword. Why? Well, the answer is that since God has spoken on the elements of worship, and if the decree of the magistrate commands its opposite, then the church must make the final decision on whether such a rule really does meet those two criteria, A and B, intelligibly temporal or temporary, and for public health, to see whether this can be tolerated for that short time. And in cases, in some cases, it can be. But beyond those boundaries, it becomes clear that A and B were not really the motive of the civil magistrate, and thus his tyrannical lust for power must be checked. Case in point, a pastor has said in the last 48 hours, in his particular location, he can go right up to your door, ring your doorbell, hand you a pizza, and you can eat it from his hand. But if that same pastor holds out in his hand the sacrament, and you take it and eat it from his hand, the same hand that handed you the pizza, he could be thrown in prison. Now I ask you, can you honestly say with a straight face that that is about public health? I think not. And we need to have, in order to have spines, better brains as well. Use number two, the directive use, we mentioned that the law of belief is the law of worship. Remember that phrase, lex sarandi, lex credendi. So that how we worship determines what we worship. We can actually take that a step further, and we'll want to do that as we ask ourselves in this time of seclusion, in this time to take inventory of what we need to repent for, What about worship? Let's take this a step further, that how we worship determines what we worship. And we might remember, if we combine that with a principle we got from the first commandment, that we become like what we behold. Now just apply that law of worship to this manner of worship. We become like how we worship. If it's true that we become like what we worship, And if it's true that how we worship determines what we worship, well, then just put those together. It follows that we become like how we worship. It structures us. What we behold in the manner, its forms, its liturgy shapes us. If we worship in chaos and darkness, then we will naturally fashion both God and our own soul's quest for him in chaos and darkness. If we worship in mere formalism, then we will make both God and our soul's relation to him a mere form. If our churches intentionally copy the structure of a mall, per se, salvation, don't be surprised if it comes across like a commercial transaction. If our churches intentionally look like gymnasiums, don't be surprised if Jesus becomes our mascot and the cross 
our team logo. Any of that ringing a bell? Of course, we've seen it. This must be repented for by the church. This must be a change coming out of this season of refinement. If the Lord would have mercy on us, then we must have holiness unto the Lord in our worship. And finally, the evangelical use of the law here. We know that idols are things that can be known and identified because idols can be turned from. Let me give you a verse for that to set us up for our gospel. When Paul wants to thank God for the evident conversion of those Thessalonians, one of the chief evidences that he lists when he thanks God for them in 1 Thessalonians 1.9 is how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Now, how can Paul spot that? And how could they have done that turning to begin with if idols were not ultimately the kind of thing that all Christians can know to leave behind? So have we left them behind? Have we turned hard away from false objects of worship? But consider Paul's words here. What to turn to? And how? When the children of Israel were snake bitten in the wilderness, God knew the right structure of worship to hold in front of them. What did God have them look to? At first glance, it was a snake on a stick. And not coincidentally, if you're thinking, well, it looks, sounds like an idol to me. Well, not coincidentally, the Jews would later worship even that physical object. But at the moment, at the moment when God ordained it to be looked at, what was it really? Well, Jesus tells us in John chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, where he says that as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Think of it. The symbol of the curse became the symbol of healing. We know this well from recent weeks, all the symbols, the snake on the staff. How did that come to be the symbol of healing? Well, the tree that was a curse became the tree of life again, and its leaves in the end in Revelation 22 too, become for the healing of the nations. How is this the case? How did this happen? What are we looking at when God would have us look? He turns us from false objects of worship to the true. He says to us, just as he said to Israel of old, turn to me and be saved. This is Isaiah 45, 22. All the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. He's telling you to turn to the true God as a savior because nobody else can save. Turn to me and be saved. Look at my son and be saved. Now, it is really true that the ultimate pandemic is the sin of Adam that had gone universally viral. Christ is not just some immunity that wears off where the sting of sin can come back with another strand. Because on that tree, he took the whole measure of God's wrath that was aimed at all of our idolatry and drank it to the dregs. As it says in Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. And so look to him. Look to him now, all the ends of the earth. Turn from your idols and look to him and be saved.